You know, I, uh, I landed, uh, my wife and I, uh, I landed at the Dallas-Fort Worth airport on uh, Wednesday night. I had just got back from a trip, and I got a text from one of the elders, and they just said, hey, uh, you know, can we talk? And I, I actually processed this, and I was like, I'm at the baggage claim. I'll talk to him tomorrow. And I actually just said, can I talk to you tomorrow? I, ne- I, don't, I just don't normally do that. And uh, they're like, no, we need to talk tonight. And so they, I talked to one of the elders, and they're like, hey, what are you doing Sunday? <laughs> Depends, right? And uh, they just said, hey, can we talk to you about what's going on? And they asked if I would be willing to speak and preach on Sunday morning and then began to share uh, about uh, Aaron, a good friend of so many of us, uh, our pastor, our leader, how, how he's stepping down and, and moving to a different location. And, and I just said, you know, yeah, I'd, I'd be honored to do that. This is definitely a weird sermon. Half of you aren't even going to hear what I'm saying. <laughs> Half of you are going to try to figure out all of this stuff. And I'm going to just tell you, don't. Uh, when I was going home, Wendy Howard had come and picked up Laura and I on our way back to Richardson. I mean, we've, we've gone to this church for 20-some years, and we've kind of seen, I feel like, a lot from youth group stuff to, you know, children's ministry stuff to pastoral stuff. Like a, Pastor Howe was a really close friend of mine before Pastor Aaron came on board. And we've just seen a lot of life here at Dallas Bible Church. And I heard the phrase so clearly, unexpected. I just heard one word, unexpected. And you, you guys know this in Scripture, it's very clear, like when you believe in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, so the Spirit can speak to us, amen? amen. And, and so I was just processing, uh, then I started asking the Lord, what does this word unexpected mean? Obviously, it's the obvious, like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. But then I kept asking him, and just very clearly, I just, I kept hearing like, you know, how to respond, responding to the unexpected. And I was like, well, is that what I'm supposed to do, God? Am I supposed to respond to the unexpected? And then started praying some more, and then I heard the phrase embracing the unexpected. So then I was like, well, am I just supposed to embrace this wholeheartedly and like just say, yeah, let's go? And so my mind was just kind of processing. And then the Lord just like, look at scripture on how to interact and deal with the unexpected. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to actually walk through the process in scripture. How do you, how do you deal with the unexpected? Because let's face this, the unexpected, it doesn't have to necessarily look like a pastor leaving, but maybe you got news about somebody passing away. In fact, just this last week, after they called and asked if I'd preach on Sunday, the next day somebody said, hey, uh, my mom passed away, can you come to a funeral on Saturday? And and so my mind is just like, man, how how do you deal with the unexpected? Some of you are like having a hard time, you lost your job, and you're kind of like, I don't know how I'm going to pay the next bill, and so you're processing, how do I deal with this unexpected? I think all of us, do we not face those things every week? I mean, that, that's reality, right? Every day, every week, we have to actually approach the unexpected with a biblical mindset. So I want us to go to 2 Chronicles 20, if you would, please. And, and I want to just say something, and it's going to be really forward and direct, but I, I, I want to honor the fact that some of you are processing, you, you, just, you had a pastor that's been here for nine years, and you just found out he's not going to be here. And the reality is, is you might not actually even understand or hear anything I say today. But I want you to take notes. Why? Because we want to use this as a framework for the church moving forward. So if you don't listen today, <laughs> like in school, have you guys ever just taken notes and you didn't have any idea what the teacher said? You guys are all good students. I was not, okay? So like, this speaks to me. Like, oh yeah, I'll take notes and I'll figure it out later barely passed, but whatever. I I do want you to write down some notes because I do believe this is of the Lord today. And uh, if you guys would, let's go with 2 Chronicles 20, uh, specifically uh, verse 1 up here on the slide. It says this, after this, the Moabites and the Ammonites. So what I want you to do is write on your notes, just write unexpected news. Can you just write that for me? I want you to be very practical here. Just write down unexpected news. Put it in your phone. Uh, Unexpected news. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites. So you basically, you have these people groups, these nations, they're, they're coming together, and then they join up with some Munites, and they came to fight against Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, fourth king of Judah, uh, this guy is overall a, a good guy. And so all of a sudden, all of these nations are going to come against Judah. By the way, that fight back then is still happening today. Isn't that crazy? They're still going after Israel today. And these people, they came and they told Jehoshaphat, 
So word had gotten out that the enemy is coming against them. And they said, a vast number from beyond the Dead Sea and from Edom has come to fight against you. They are already in Hazazan Tamar, that is in En Gedi. So at that moment, unexpected news, what do you do? You have a king, you've got a whole group of people, you have all of these things that could be going for you, and the next thing you know, everybody's coming, coming after you. So how do you respond to unexpected news? Everybody has different ways. If you look at King Jehoshaphat in verse 3, what you'll begin to see here is this. Jehoshaphat was afraid. Emotions are real, and you shouldn't shy away from them today. I remember when I first heard that Pastor Aaron and Kat were leaving, it was like a, huh, whoa. Like it was kind of that shock factor. It's kind of like this, wait a minute. And your mind just starts processing all these different things. And I want you to kind of go with me. Anybody ever seen the movie Inside Out? Okay, let's go with movie number one. Uh, Remember anger? Some of you could be angry right now. You could be angry at Aaron, you could be angry at Kat, you could be angry at the elders, like it's an actual real emotion. Another emotion is is disgust, right? Inside out. Another one is fear. What's going to happen to the church? What's going to happen to our leadership? What's going to happen to the staff? What's going to happen to the direction? So you have this fear mindset, but maybe there's some joy and and whatever the, the emotion is, they're real and we're not discounting them today. But then they made another movie. Inside out, too, because there's more emotions. One of those emotions very clearly could be anxious, anxiety. You could be like, I don't know if I, I don't know, should I come back? I'm getting a little anxious. I'm getting a little worried about this. Maybe even envy. Maybe even there's that one that I never know how to pronounce. Inua, 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 anwa, whatever. It me, ennui, thank you. It me, thank you. You should be preaching. It means apathy. Like some of you, you don't even care. Like there's all kinds of emotions. People will be crying. People are crying. People are mad. People are like, whatever. I want you to understand. Let's be respectful of everybody in this emotional period of time. Is that fair? I don't know why this chair squeaks. It didn't squeak the first service. (laughs) He did that. I just want to just say is, is like, I don't want you to discount the emotions, but here's what I want to say. Don't stay in that place. That's why churches split. Let's be real. Denominations are here because we couldn't get along with other people. Now, you could say, oh, there's theological differences and all that. Yeah, yeah. My point is this. On the emotion side of things, okay, Jehoshaphat was afraid, but then look what he did. He resolved to seek the Lord. He didn't stay in this place of anxiousness. He didn't stay in this place of fear. He then sought the Lord. Dallas Bible Church, you have an actual crossroads today. Which way do I want to go? And my proposal is seek the Lord. In fact, this seeking the Lord, it actually means you're proactively pursuing him. You're proactively wanting to know him in this process. So then you have to say, well, how do I even do that? I love what Jehoshaphat does. It says, he resolved to seek the Lord, and then he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. So he says, all right, God, I'm going to seek you, and I'm going to get everybody together at Dallas Bible Church. And you know what he does? He calls for a fast. I think it's actually a fair statement. For us, for my wife, Laura, and I, and a lot of the people that have been here a lot longer than I have, like this is an actual real important day in our church. And you have an option to be the emotional high person that's gonna create and push in and say, man, I need to know everything. That's fine, but don't stay in that place. Go seek the Lord. And how do you seek the Lord? The scripture says, well, fast. Now, fasting, actually, what we've done, and I've done this too, in the sense of fasting, it means, oh, I'm going to disregard certain things in my life. Fast in Scripture, in the Old Testament, it means abstain from eating. Well, Taco Tuesday is pretty amazing. (laughs) Whatever. You know, my point is, is that we come up with all of these thoughts, but fasting actually means you're setting aside something that you desire so that you can seek the Lord. Dallas Bible Church, my proposal is, and I said it to the first uh, service with the elders and to the staff, please put together some form of a corporate fast for this body. Do we not want to see God move in this church? 
Amen. We kind of need some direction. And it doesn't have to be, oh, I I have my one-year plan or my three-year plan or my five-year plan. We just need God to show up. And I actually believe it's a fast. That's what Jehoshaphat did. He was overwhelmed with life, and he gathered everybody together. My my heart is that sometime he would be chaos. But wouldn't it be cool if the youth just stayed here? And then we brought in all the babies and all of the, we'd, we'd, fire code would be bad. We'd shut off streaming. <laughs> I didn't say that. I'm just kidding. Lord. My point is, is like everybody has to buy in to saying, God, we want to seek the Lord. That's my heart behind this. Like there's something about the younger and the older combining and saying, God, we really need you to show up. <laughs> It's fine. (laughs) Uh, They even came from the cities of Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat, he stood in the assembly of Judah and in Jerusalem in the Lord's temple before the new courtyard. So this fasting, if you'll go to the next slide, the prophet Joel, he writes about this. Uh, Yeah, thanks. Even now, this is the Lord's declaration. Turn to me with all of your heart. Turn to me with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. I actually believe that when we seek the Lord, one of the disciplines of spirituality is fasting. When you hear news like our good friend, Pastor Aaron, leaving after nine years, God, we need to know which direction do you want us to go? I know we have an elders. I know we have staff, but our thoughts go that way, do we not? And if you go back to the Psalm 14 text for me just for a second, God is truly looking. I love this. The Lord looks down from heaven on the human race, on Dallas Bible Church, on Hillcrest and Arapaho. He literally looks into Richardson and in Carrollton and in Garland and in Mesquite. Come on, somebody else come farther than that? McKinney. That's all I got. God is looking down to see if there's one who is wise. Is there somebody in this room that will seek God? Because that's really what he's looking for. He's looking for you and I to say, I'm going to seek the Lord. And in this case of Jehoshaphat, he says, will you fast as well? You know, I've, I've only done, uh, and I, I hope you hear this in humility, I've done one 40-day fast in my life. I did no food, just uh, water and occasional Gatorade. <laughs> And I'm not proposing this, so please don't hear this up to the Lord. I'm just telling you my experience. Those 40 days changed my life. And after that period of fasting, um, not only did I lose a lot of weight, um, I heard so clearly from the Lord. I think our church is at a point where we need to hear from the Lord. Moses fasted for 40 days. Jesus fasted for 40 days. Esther called for a corporate fast. Nehemiah, right? He did a fast. Daniel, he did a 21-day fast of fruits and vegetables. Maybe that sounds more appealing. I just don't like vegetables. (laughs) (laughs) The Day of Atonement in Leviticus. Every Israelite, every year, once a year, was asked to fast. My proposal is, is that in unexpected times, Dallas Bible, we need to seek the Lord. And one way that it can manifest itself is by fasting. I want you to start preparing your hearts for what this could look like. At the same time, aside from if you'll keep going past Joel, if you don't mind, if you'll go to the next slide. I I love this quote from uh, J.G. McConville. You know, when we deal with our emotions and the thoughts about how do I do this, there's no excuse for Christians' hopelessness. The Christian's response in the blackest hour must be, my eyes are upon the. So when you're like, hey, I don't, I don't have a pastor anymore, or all of a sudden you're thinking like, I just lost a family member that passed away, or, or man, it looks really hard right now in our country. That's the reality. You know where we should look, right? Not on our signs that are out in our yards. The scripture says, and this guy says the same thing, our eyes need to be on the Lord. I think for me, when I, when I process unexpected times. It's okay to have these emotions, but at some point, you got to give them to the Lord and not hold on to them. You know, I think for me, the last, uh, beyond this announcement, for the last couple months, for me personally, I've been processing some things, 
And it wasn't until I actually released it and shared my emotions with somebody that I found healing. Does that make sense? And you need to express it to the Lord, and I think you need to express it to other people. But I want to say something, because I can say this because it's not coming from leadership. Like, the things that you're saying, you guys, we don't need backbiting and behind-the-door rumors or gossips. This is not an immoral thing. This is not an unethical thing of why Pastor Aaron is leaving. He truly sensed from the Lord this was his time and he's moving on to another location. So you don't have to play these games in your mind. Is that fair? If you'll keep going, if you don't mind, please. And the slides here. You know, what Jehoshaphat does is this. If you guys will follow along with me in the word of God. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 6, as, as, he, as he gathered everybody together, right, in the courtyard, as they all came together, he began to pray. And this was his prayer. Yahweh, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand, and no one can stand against you. And so what he does is, is that for the next couple verses, Jehoshaphat, before all of the people in their time, right now, understand this, the only thing that they know is that they're going to be overtaken by a whole lot of nations. Like they are going to be overcome and it doesn't feel right. So he gathers everybody together and then he says, I want us to fast and now I need us to start praying. And he begins to pray and the first thing he does in his prayer is he acknowledges that God is still in control. I think sometimes we lose sight like, oh no, it's a Republican or oh no, it's a Democrat. Or, oh no, the inflation rate went this way or they went this way. And our eyes are shifted on one thing. But I'm telling you, when we pray, the first thing we need to talk about is God is still in control. Like that's the realness of how we have to at Dallas Bible in this new season, we got to start pressing in and praying. Praise the Lord. And I love what MacArthur says, that God is still in control. How many believe that? Amen? You got to pray like it then. I, I've, I've gone to Africa quite a bit the last couple of years. You ever been in a room full of Africans that just pray? I'm like, Lord, I just want to know how to pray like that. There's something in their spirit. When you hang out with Burundians or Malawians or Nigerians or Kenyans, and they just start praying. And there's a realness that they believe this. Wouldn't it be cool if Dallas Bible Church was known as that's the praying church? We can be, you know that. Another part of the prayer of Jehoshaphat in verse 7, aside from God's sovereignty, if you'll keep going here in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, it says, Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and who gave it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Now, I know that in this context, Jehoshaphat is praying and he's reminding him, God, there's a covenant, right? You guys remember this? You remember all these incredible covenants, the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant? God, you have promised to be with us forever. (laughs) I think sometimes we need to remind us and God. Strangely enough as it sounds, we have to say it out loud. God, I know you're not going to leave me. Romans 8, you'll never leave me nor forsake me. Nothing will divide us. Not even death, actually, will divide us or separate us from the Lord. And I think if you start praying like that, we might actually start seeing some really unique things even in the body of Christ here. So you're understanding God's sovereignty, you're understanding God's covenant, and then when you keep going into verse 8 and 9, this is what the scripture says. They've lived in the land and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name. And they've said, if disaster comes on us, sword or judgment, pestilence or famine, we will stand before this temple and before you, before your name in this temple, we will cry out to you because of our distress and you will hear and deliver. What what I love about Jehoshaphat's prayer is, God, I love that you're going to be with me wherever we go. So even if our senior pastor leaves, how many believe that God's still here? Even if we've lost a a youth a, a youth pastor, we have Molly, but you know Cameron or uh, Cameron that was that was a while ago. Warren, like when you lose Warren. Like, can God still show up there? I mean, we've been praying for children's ministry, and praise the Lord, Tim has stepped in as an interim, but you know we're, we've been praying for children's people to fulfill that role. Like, God, 
we still believe that even though we're still looking for those people, God is still moving here. That's the beauty of all of this. In fact, yesterday I was in Plano, downtown Plano, 4 o'clock. Actually, it was like 3.50. And I got out of my car. You guys, you guys are trying to find parking in downtown Plano? It's ridiculous. But it's kind of entertaining for me. And so all of a sudden I parked, and there was a guy in the distance. And man, it was so clear. The Holy Spirit was like, you need to go talk to that guy and ask him his name. Now, uh, if you know anything about my wife and I in the ministry, like sometimes I'll run after these people. <laughs> I didn't think that was really appropriate. It's kind of weird. So I was like, hey, <laughs> have, you guys, have you guys ever waved to somebody and they didn't acknowledge you? <laughs> you know, that awkward moment. You're like, hey, and they're like, I, I'm pretty sure he heard me. So then I finally, I picked up my pace. That's called stalking. And, <laughs> and then I walked over and I go, hey, I didn't clap. That was just me. And I was like, hey, can I ask you your name? And he just stopped. And he goes, my name is Emmanuel. And we shook hands. No, he wasn't an angel. (laughs) (laughs) But, But like, I just in that moment, I just sensed the presence of God in Plano. And I think in my prayer life, what I want to encourage you with is is acknowledge that God wants to be with you. Emmanuel means God with us. (laughs) And I'm processing this message for today. God, how do you give a message to two services, to the church that's going to hear that their pastor, who we have loved, is leaving? They're going to announce it. And as we were talking, like, should I give a message after the announcement or should I give it before the announcement? I don't know. There's not really a win. There's only a win when you understand that the presence of God will never leave you. In unexpected times, seek God. And when you seek God, church, we need to fast. And I can't force that on you. It has to be birthed inside of you that I really want to see God move in my life. And when fasting begins to take place, yes, it's weird. You start losing weight. It is hard. You're like, I really would like fill in the blank, oatmeal cream pies. I don't know why I said that. We don't even have those in our house. (laughs) Maybe we should, Laura, before the fast. I'm kind of serious, though. Like, you have to, the church in America has to start stripping themselves of things that we really like. What else are we going to expect? We don't see anything changes unless we do something to change. And so when there's a fasting that takes place, and then we start praying like Jehoshaphat, let's go to verse 10 if we can. He he just says, "Now now here are the Ammonites, Moabites, and the inhabitants of Mount Seir in Edom. You do not let Israel invade them when Israel came out of the land of Egypt, but Israel turned away from them and did not destroy them. You know what he's praying right here? God, you have been so good in the past. That's what he's praying. So he acknowledges God's goodness. I bet every one of us, if we took five minutes right now, you could say, this is how God's been so good in my life. Like, Instead of focusing on the, oh my gosh, I can't believe we just lost our senior pastor, which we know we're grieving, we know that it hurts, and we know that there's some emotions. But I'm telling you, we got to get our eyes on God's goodness. What's something that, when you think of God's goodness, what comes to your mind? Shout it out. All the youth coming in. Amen. They, They couldn't even move. Trust me, they're like right next to me. The baptisms, praise God, baptisms. What's another thing of God's goodness? Donuts. <laughs> no, that's the only thing you're going to clap for? <laughs> this has now become a time of repentance, okay? <laughs> Confession. No, I, I don't even know how to respond to that. Thank you. God's goodness is good. My, my son, I think he's probably the one that's gotten cut off here, but he loves donuts. Anything else about God's goodness? Redemption. Redemption. His word. Okay, hang on. I think the point is this. We can constantly focus on God's goodness. And when you keep your eyes on that, that should give Dallas Bible Church hope. In unexpected times, we have to seek the Lord, willingly want to hear from him through fasting and through prayer. And how do we pray? Let's start focusing on these things of God. Keep going on, if you don't mind, please. Verse 11. Look how they repay us by coming to drive us out of your possession that you gave us as an inheritance. 
But basically, they're just recognizing these things in this context, the land. But they're recognizing the things that God have, has given them. If you go to verse 12, if you don't mind, please. It says, Our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this vast number. Remember, this is Jehoshaphat praying with everybody. God, will you not judge the enemies? I want to make sure, and I want to make sure this is clear. I'm saying this not for, against Cat and Aaron when I say this context. This is against the enemies that were coming against Jehoshaphat. This is not against Cat or Aaron. Just don't make that correlation, please. For we are powerless before this vast number that comes to fight against us. I, I love this. And I, honestly, this is try to how I live my life. We don't know what to do, but we look to you. What a great Dallas Bible Church motto. Hey, what's your mission? Mission. Mission. Mission? Oh my gosh. Vision and vision. I looked at the six values on the church, the 30 beliefs, the, the beliefs and the values and the practices that we have. We have all of those things. What if outside the sign it just says, we don't know what to do, but we look to you? <laughs> You'd be like, I don't know. Those guys are either really weird or I'm in. <laughs> but isn't it kind of refreshing to think you don't have a game plan except God's? Yeah. Look, I really am as type A as you come. I love plans. I love details. I love thoroughness. But Scripture says without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And God help us sometimes the church at large in America has has outplanned God. We don't know what to do. I, I, <laughs> don't change brochures or anything. I just, <laughs> I just think this is a real picture of in unexpected times, it's actually okay to be humble and say, God, I got no answers. Our country is at that point. And some of you right now in your own life, you just that utter dependence, and you just radically need him. And I'd like to propose that Dallas Bible is, we really need the Lord right now. I'm going to keep saying it, in unexpected times, seek the Lord, please, to get to know his presence through fasting and through prayer. And my prayer is, is that sometime in the next two weeks, you guys, that you would hear something like, this is what Dallas Bible is going to do. Gary O'Neill, when I first came to Dallas Bible Church, I came here as a seminary student at Dallas Theological Seminary, and we prayed in that fireside room. And Gary, you led prayer all of the time. Vivian Summy was there. Wendy was there. We had these prayer warriors, Dick Simmons, and we just pressed in old school and we prayed. I think our church, we need that. If you'll keep going, if you don't mind, please. As you seek the Lord, please listen for direction. Unexpected times, seek the Lord, and then just listen. All Judah was standing before the Lord. By the way, my whole comments about bringing in the youth and the children's, it actually is a biblical model. I'm not saying you have to do it all the time, but all Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children. That's a whole lot of people, by the way. And they're standing there in the middle of this standing. They're listening for direction. Verse 14, look what happens in the middle of the actual sanctuary, in the middle of the congregation. It says, in the middle of their congregation, the spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel. Jehaziel, look how he's described. The son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, son of Mattaniah, a Levite from Asaph's descendants. So he's a, he's a man of God. Many would say he was actually probably a musician. And then he said this. So in the middle of this, like, congregation. Somebody stands up in the middle of prayer time. Can you imagine that? Um, excuse me, I have a word. Marty Paris all of a sudden just stands up and says something. Like That's the context of what we're talking about. We're pressing in and we're praying. And the next thing you know, he says, listen carefully, all Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. You know what he's saying? Hey, by the way, and even you, King, I need you to know this is of the Lord. I never forget, I was in Kosovo, if you guys, in the Balkan states, and I was in a meeting with some government heads, and this gentleman had been a, a charged with 300 murders at The Hague. He was acquitted, and I was in a meeting with some Israelis, some Americans, some Albanians, and at the end of the meeting, the Lord so clearly told me, ask this prime minister for a spirit of forgiveness in this meeting. 
By the way, he's Muslim. And you want to know where and what raised up inside of me? This text. You see, when you have the word of God inside of you, you can have confidence that God's going to release something and speak to you. Does that make sense? Like, if it aligns with the word of God, that's, the, that's what we're after. Jehaziel just says, hey, by the way, do not be afraid or discouraged. What was his first emotion that he had when he felt overwhelmed? Afraid. So all of a sudden, the word of the Lord speaks to your emotions. So as you're processing that, you know, Aaron, Pastor Aaron and Kat are leaving, I want you to know something. When you seek the Lord and listen for direction, he'll speak to that emotion. But you got to be in the word and you got to be in the body of Christ. You cannot do this alone. God did not design the body of Christ to be loners. And he says, don't be afraid or discouraged because of this vast number, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Well, that's a great game plan if you believe God is big. When you go to the next text, if you would, please. Jehaziel continues, he says, tomorrow go down against them. You'll see them coming up the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the valley facing the wilderness of Jericho. What, what, was, what were they doing at this time that this man had a prophetic word? What was the whole group doing? Do you remember? They were praying. Everybody had come together, and God gave them direction in the middle of their prayer time. And he says, you don't have to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. That standing still. Sorry, Brian, I'm going to go there again. Brian and I were talking, Brian Radaball, one of your uh, uh, pastors here at Dallas Bible. We were talking in the back, and we were talking about, he's like, yeah, I just, not really a board guy kind of guy. Anybody like board games? Well, Brian doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have to confess, I don't either. Do you know why? They're called board games. <laughs> okay. Now, some of you are like, like, well, I'm not anti-games, okay? I like Uno. Um, we have a hard time sometimes sitting still is the whole point. Sometimes you just, you get antsy. You, you got to get up. You got to get moving. You got to do something. In this context, if you want to see God move, stand still. Well. That's a pretty awesome goal. And see the salvation of the Lord. He is with you, Judah, in Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. He said it again. What was the emotion that he had? Afraid. He says it two times. The prophetic releases a word. By the way, Dallas Bible has talked about spiritual gifts in the past. In 1 Corinthians 14, we actually believe in the gifts if you do them according to the word of God. Now remember, in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, it says pursue love, Right? Above all, love is what we should walk out. But in the process, he says, you should also pursue the gifts. And one of those gifts is prophecy. Prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, it says prophetic can happen as long as it's encouraging, edifying, and comforting, consolation. Does that make sense? In fact, at the end of the first service, somebody raised their hand here in Dallas Bible Church. Kind of raised their hand like this. And then got a little bit more confident and raised her hand. And she had a word. It was scripture. It was Isaiah 43. She went over to the elders. The elders stood right over here. She shared what she sensed as a prophetic. They approved that this was of the Lord. And she released that word into the whole body. It was so of the Lord. You see, I believe when you seek the Lord... I need to read this. Can we read this? Can you guys go to this? is what was released. Go to Isaiah 43, if you would, please. Uh, Wendy, are you here? What was it? Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Can you guys just go there? Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. So at the end of the first service, like literally just an hour and a half ago, this is what she shared to the elders. They approved this word as a confirming word, and then she released this over that actual body. Isaiah 43, 18. I just don't want you guys to miss this. Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to the things of old. Look, I am about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Amen. That, I want to just address something. That wasn't scary. 
That wasn't weird. It was she heard from the Lord. Eldership said, yes, that is of the Lord. We released it, and that encourages you. That's what happened with Jehaziel. Jehaziel in the middle, you can go back to these slides. Jehaziel in the middle of the congregation says, hey, guys, we're going to stand still, not fight, and watch God show up. You can keep going if you don't mind. And I love Psalm 46. You guys know this verse. Some, some of your version says, be still. My version says, stop fighting, stop your fighting, and know that I am God. Exalted among the nations, exalted on the earth. You know what that means? You actually believe that God is still God. And let him be God. As you keep going through this text, if we would, please, that would be great. So then this is what Jehoshaphat did. When he heard the prophetic word, when he heard the word that Israel, Judah, I should say, was actually not going to have to fight, how did he respond? Jehoshaphat, it says, he bowed with his face to the ground. He literally didn't care what anybody else thought. He literally bowed with his face to the ground. And then all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they fell down before the Lord to worship him. And so right in front of everybody, everybody just fell and they just, they began to worship the Lord. You know, the very first time, most people wouldn't know this. Um, J.P. Finley was a, a former worship pastor here. And J.P. Finley is a good friend of a guy named Michael Miller. Michael Miller is the pastor of the upper room. Before Michael was the pastor at the upper room, JP and Michael actually did a ministry called I-55 at Farmer's Branch at the Church of Christ. And when Dallas Bible Church launched my wife and I to start a ministry called Dal uh, the Tent Revival, we did the Dallas Tent Revival, a 40-day tent revival, I was going to meet with different pastors. And I went to this Farmer's Branch Church of Christ on a Tuesday night, our worship pastor and Michael. And I walk into this church and everybody's on their face. Everybody. I was the only guy standing. I just walked in the room. I didn't even know what was going on. And so I just, because I felt the presence of the Lord, instantly, I just, not like I got knocked over. I just, in awe, I fell down on my face. I think the church has got to get to that point again, experiencing the presence of the Lord. He's not a, a, a check-in clock. You guys know that when you punch in and then you punch out? Like, the presence of God is with us at all times. And when these guys, when they heard that God was going to take care of them, they fell down in awe, and they didn't care what anybody thought of them. Their shirts probably became untucked. Their phones probably went one way. They probably looked a little disheveled. And I think the church has got to get out of this posture that you've got to look perfect before the Lord. His presence will overwhelm you. And in that moment, I didn't even care when I fell on my face. So I want to just say, don't judge people the way they worship anymore, you guys. There's got to be some freedom in worshiping the Lord. Yeah, but what am I going to do if I'm in the green chair? This is my chair, my spot. <laughs> I mean, I think the same thing. We used to have Luby's chairs. Do you guys remember that? With the wheels? That didn't work. We probably still have them. <laughs> my point is this. Like, you guys... When you're in the presence of the Lord and you respond in obedience, there actually is freedom. There's freedom. And you won't care anymore what you look like. Because you have a holy perspective of God. Hmm. And so they fell down in obedience. It says in verse 19 and on in 2 Chronicles. It says, and the Levites from the sons of the Kohathites and the Korazites, they stood to praise the Lord God of Israel, shouting with a loud voice. So as people are on their face, you've got that back crowd in the back. All of a sudden, <laughs> Jordan just starts standing up and he starts shouting, hey, praise God. And then everybody looks back at them like, well, those guys are weird. You guys know that. We have one or two people that say amen. And then you look at them. If you don't, you want to. <laughs> Good old evangelical jokes, right? You know, my point is this. Like when people are on their face, some people are shouting, praising Jesus. And I really believe when you sense his presence, you'll find freedom. That's not because you have to start doing this. I'm not, I'm not implying that. I'm not saying that we haven't been doing that. I just, I want you to show that when you respond in obedience, you might start doing things that you're not used to. Amen? 
Let's go on to verse 20. So it says, In the morning they got up early, and they went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. As they were about to go out, Jehoshaphat stood and he said, Hear me, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in Yahweh your God and you will be established. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. In other words, at this point, the leadership then affirmed that that word was from the Lord. This is a biblical model. Do you see this? He says, by the way, the prophets, what I just heard, this is God. Can you guys go to Hebrews 11 verse 6, if you would, please? Go to Hebrews 11 verse 6. It's not going to be up on your slides, but it's the New Testament version of 2 Chronicles 20. Go to Hebrews 11 verse 6. It's in the faith chapter, right? You guys know this chapter. Hebrews 11, in unexpected times, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to seek the Lord in fasting and in prayer. And as we listen for direction, we will begin to respond. I love this, in obedience. All right, so let's go there. Hebrews 11, verse 6, very, very clear. It says this, by, he says, Now without faith it is impossible to please God. For the one who draws near to him, by the way, that's like the seeking language, right? Seeking him. The one who draws near to him must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who seek him. Really what that means is as you seek the Lord, this is not a prosperity deal. You just have to start believing that God's going to answer and show up. Don't, Don't make this overly complicated. Unexpected times, you seek the Lord in fasting and in prayer. He's going to show you by listening, and then he's going to ask you to respond. And what we're asking in Dallas Bible Church is that we would love to hear from you as you hear from him. Don't put this just on four guys, four elders. Don't just put this on the staff and say, okay, guys, what's the direction we're going to go? I actually think if we do that many, many times, we miss that you have a voice in the body of Christ. We want to hear from you. We need to hear from you. You have so many gifts, so many talents that we want to hear your voice and believe that he wants to speak to you. Man, last service, I wasn't expecting the, 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 the woman to raise her hand, and yet I was. We need to start getting into a posture over and over that when we respond, God's going to show up. Let's keep going here if we can. Let's go back to Second Chronicles. So then what did he do? He, kept, he consulted. Jehoshaphat, he consulted with the people. He appointed some to sing for the Lord. <laughs> I really want to do this sometime. This group over here is going to start singing. This group over here is going to start praising the Lord. But that's what happened. The leadership appointed some that sing and some to praise the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And when they went out in front of the armed forces, Tom Jankowski, this is you. Tom actually serves the National Guard and Tom actually is a musician and that he actually, that's his role. He is a musician. Tom, this is you. But can I just tell you this? What if he asked all of us to start praising the Lord and singing before a fight? Would we do it? Well, if you're seeking the Lord and you're fasting and you're praying, and this is what he tells us to do, we should respond in obedience. It didn't say, no, you go first. It didn't say, no, you go. I'll come after you. It just says, then they went out in front of the armed forces and they kept singing. And they were probably referencing Psalm 136. They said, give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love endures forever. Everything was on the Lord, you guys. This focus about a battle, it was on the Lord. Some of you are like, I don't even know how I'm going to pay my next bill. Get your eyes on the Lord. He'll direct you. Some of you are dealing with a marriage issue. Get your eyes on the Lord. He'll help you and bring restoration. Some of you are dealing with, I don't even know if I should be in this school or should I move. Like, get your eyes on the Lord. He will direct you in every step of the way. But you got to give God room to move. If you go to the next slide for me, please. I love this, and I'd actually encourage you to take a picture of this. Um, This comes from a guy named Bob Hooker, and he said, God doesn't have to make sense to us. Like, when you respond in obedience, what he tells you, it doesn't have to make sense. I remember when I had that dream uh, about having a, a, a government official in another country call a whole country to repent. That made no sense to me. But don't try to outthink God. We simply obey the instructions even when they don't make sense. Do you remember what our Dallas Bible motto is? <laughs> Do you remember the early one? 
Like a, hey, we don't know what to do, but God does deal. So refreshing. The rest of our lives, we must realize that when God's plan makes no sense to us, it's his plan. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Maybe not always. I'm not supposed to understand everything. And then I last, the, I love this last point here. How great would God really be if we as finite humans could understand everything about him? You know, I, this whole week I've been processing, you know, I, I'm not really sure why Pastor Aaron and Kat left. Like in my mind, in my heart, I'm like, man, but sometimes God's ways are so much bigger. And what if God spoke to them, which I believe has happened, and he's directing their steps to a, a different location so that they can flourish in a new season? We have to be okay with that as the body of Christ. But what if God's speaking to you about doing something that maybe is a little bit different? In fact, I had a guy come up to me after the service. He says, I've never done this. I've never even heard this thing. And then he released a word to me. He shared something with me. And he, he, he always like, I don't even, I've never even done this before. Like he was putting himself in a posture of faith. And that's what we need to do at Dallas Bible in this, in this new season. We have a building permit that has been approved. We don't know what that looks. I mean, we do, we have a plan. <laughs> that sounded bad. <laughs> but like, you don't know who's going to show up. I don't know who's going to show up, but by faith, you keep walking it out. I just, how great would God really be if as finite humans, we really could understand everything about him? We wouldn't want to know. And I'm so thankful, to be honest, for Aaron and Kat and everything that they've done here at Dallas Bible for nine plus years. God has used them to get us to this point. But that doesn't mean we're done. What if he wants to take us to a whole new place of maturity? He can do that. And I believe that because of the text. When you look at this text, let's go back here as we really look to wrap up. Second Chronicles 20 says, the moment that they began their shout. So in, in other words, the moment that they began to sing and praise and shout, the moment that they listened to that prophetic word, it says, the Lord set an ambush against the Ammonites, Moabites, and the inhabitants of Mount Seir who came to fight against the Judah, and they were defeated. Does it say anything about what the Israelites or the people from Judah had to do? The Lord did all of the work. If you'll keep going here, please. The Ammonites and Moabites, they turned against the inhabitants of Mount Seir and completely annihilated them. And then when they finished with the inhabitants of Seir, I don't understand this, you guys. They helped destroy each other. When they responded in obedience to what they heard from God through a prophet or through a prophetic word, I want you to understand you need to trust that God will answer and show up. But you'll never get to this point unless you don't go through this process of actually seeking the Lord. What I don't want to happen is in this season at Dallas Bible is you coming here saying, okay, leaders, you tell us what we're going to do. I don't want you to just keep showing up and say, well, that didn't meet my needs. What are they doing? That's not what we're asking. We're asking corporately Dallas Bible Church to seek the Lord together. Through fasting, through prayer, please listen for direction. Tell us what you're hearing. Tell the staff what you're hearing. Tell the elders what you're hearing. And then in the process, what if we all get to respond corporately and go sing up and down Hillcrest? You're like, well, I'm changing churches. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do you know the first time I saw Rankin and met Rankin? He was a worship leader up on the stage in the early days of Dallas Bible Church. God can use you. That's not, that was a bad transition. That was a bad transition. God can use anybody. That's not what I meant. Like, what I'm implying is, is like, like, he might ask you to step up into a different role in the church in this season that you're not used to is what I'm trying to get at. It's kind of all hands on deck right now. And uh, I really believe God wants to move in this body. It says in verse 24, it says, when Judah came to a place and they, over, they were overlooking the wilderness, they, they looked for the large army, but there were only corpses lying on the ground. Nobody had escaped. 
So when they just came to the scene, they had done nothing except praising and singing. And Jehoshaphat says, and his people, they went to gather the plunder. They found among them an abundance of goods and the bodies and the valuable items. So they stripped them until nobody could carry any more. They were gathering the plunder for three days because there was so much. Can you imagine what would happen is if Dallas Bible spent some time fasting and praying and then really seeking the Lord, maybe in a new and a fresh way that we haven't done. Can you imagine what would it look like in three months, what we would say? What about in six months? What about nine months? You're kind of like, man, I cannot believe this happened in this church. And you're like, yeah, we didn't plan it. God just showed up. That sounds so refreshing to me. And I bet you to the staff and the elders, it does as well. Finally, in verse 26, this is it. They assembled in the Valley of Barakah, which means blessings. On the fourth day, all the folks from Judah, and there they praised the Lord. Can I have our worship uh, crew come on up if you don't mind? And therefore, that place is still called the Valley of Barakah today. So God showed up even in unexpected times. And I love what one of our uh, good friends and seasoned uh, believers here at the church, he came up to me, he said, Kyle, remember that even though we are caught off guard with these unexpected times, God is never caught off and he's always expecting it to unfold. Amen. Here's what I want to do. Uh, I think this is just really important. Can we just spend like two to three minutes praying? Uh, you've heard something from the Lord, hopefully. Hopefully the scripture is speaking to you. Hopefully the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. But I just really think it's important that, you know, maybe just with two or three people around you, you can pray by yourself. You could grab a hand to somebody next to you. And can we just pray? I don't, I'm not even going to instruct you how to pray. You've heard the word of the Lord. And I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, how do you want me to respond to this? What do you want me to hear? God, am I even seeking you? God, how am I feeling? Whatever that is, you talk to the Lord. Because I'm telling you, if we don't do it now, why would we do it today? I've got fantasy football in front of me. I love NFL. I love sports. And then I love my kids. I love my family. We can come up with all of these things. And I'm telling you guys, the things that will get in the way of us seeking the Lord, pressing in for what he wants. So just slow down for a minute. And let's just experience the presence of the Lord afresh and anew.